I'm Catalin Marinas, uh, co-maintainer of the ARM64 kernel port. And now this presentation is a slight change from uh, what I'm normally doing, like writing C and assembly. It's actually trying to be more thorough in uh, verifying that the algorithms, algorithms we put in the kernel actually guarantee us some properties. So, yeah, that's a quick agenda. I'll, I'll go through some of the work uh, I've been doing in, um, well, using TLM Plus, and um, give some, some examples, hopefully, it get, gets, gets a picture of what this is about, <coughs> how it could be used for other algorithms. And so why use formal methods? It, it allows one to reason. Hmm? Oh. Yeah, yeah, move it higher. Yeah, so, sorry about that. So <clears throat> yeah, maybe I shouldn't look at the, <laughs> the big screen. Hmm? It's still not working. Still not working? Yes. Do you want to try and use the mic? Yeah, yeah, I will. You know why it's not working? Thank you. Now, oh. is it any better now? OK, so uh, why use formal methods? It's not usually, I think it's, it's funnier to just write the C code rather than uh, actually verify it. But uh, going for some formal, formal model of your algorithms helps you think through the problem and actually uh, even probably sometimes it gets harder to actually figure out what properties you want to show about, uh, about your algorithm. And uh, there are different, well, there are too, ma too many things here. Is the, either you, you have your algorithm specified in a formal way, you, you can either come up with a formal proof of your properties, and that's usually pretty time consuming. And unless you do this for a living, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and the other simpler option, what's computing intensive, is to use model checking. And uh, yeah, it, it helps you spot bugs. It's not a you know, complete guarantee, an absolute proof that your algorithm is correct because you have lots of assumptions when modeling. For example, you may not fully model your memory system, memory ordering, <coughs> and you usually make simplifications. But, uh, so how I started with this, uh, I had the, gave it a go on some of the ARM64 algorithms we used in the kernel. And um, I was uh, initially surprised just to find bugs in a uh, in couple of them was the ACID allocator. That's the ACID is used to tag the TLBs to avoid uh, invalidating the TLBs at, at context switch. And uh, yeah, to my surprise, it found a bug in the rollover logic. And it's very hard to trigger in, uh, in practice. But uh, yeah, if you know how to, maybe it's not impossible. And uh, went through some other models you can see in here on uh, ARM64. I think a notable one is the KVM handling of the VGIC, uh, the, the interrupt controller, virtual interrupt controller. That was done by Valentin Schneider in uh, ARM. Um, What's different is actually, it was different here, is that it, it has a model, an abstract model of the interrupt controller and of the hypervisor handling of such interrupts. So it can show different properties. And while it didn't find a bug, it confirmed a bug. It was actually fixed before the model was finished. So what's TLA plus and TLA plus it started as a formal specification language developed by Leslie Lamport. And his aim was originally just to specify using temporal logic and, um, and uh, ZF set theory just to specify behavior, system behavior. Um, someone else, you and you figure out that actually you can uh, model check the the full specification, so he came up with a TLC, so TLA model checker. Uh, could also be used for, 
to have proper machine checked proofs and it requires a backend. But as I said, this is pretty time consuming to write your, your like a hierarchical proof of, of your algorithm. Plus call, I think this one came from the Loria Institute in France, is actually a pseudocode like language, uh, much closer to what programmers are used to. And it translates into TLA plus, and then you can apply the TLA plus model checker on top. And it has a simple way to describe concurrency. And yet, yeah, TLA plus has been used over the years, and uh, some, some examples here. <coughs> Now I'll go for I'll go for a simple example of what TLA plus. So the syntax may look scary, but uh, I think if you look stare at this for some time here, actually you get used to it. But that's TLA plus. So it's pure TLA. It's not plus call. So that's basically what you have in here is a way of describing a system behavior, and you can say at the end, the last line is the specification which means that your behavior, but behavior is a sequence of states. So what you say at the end by the specification is that my sequence of states, describe what's allowed in the system, sh should, um, uh, guarantee should, should match uh, the initial state, so should start from a tick and count zero. This is a simple example that, well, let's say you have one part that ticks, it changes the tick variable from zero to one, and we have some other part in the system that counts the number of ticks. And uh, what's this temporal, uh, temporal logic does here is that, for example, tick is an action and it describes a relation between two successive states. So in it is the initial state uh, initialized to zero. Tick prime is actually the variable in the next state. Um, Count is something that counts the number of ticks, and the next step for your system, the behavior, is actually either tick or count. So this allows one to generate a sequence of states. Interestingly, that's not sufficient. This, um, well, actually may not do what you expect, so you can, it allows behaviors of this type where uh, you can get uh, only the count action taking place or only the tick action taking place. And TLA plus also allows for infinite stuttering steps where nothing changes. So I'll go quickly through these now as um, you know, a be better spec would be to ask, add another variable in here to have some synchronization between tick and count. Now, I only introduced this briefly. I think I'll go to some, uh, I would say, more software related examples. So I'll go for a spin lock model, a spin lock implementation in Pascal uh, using uh, a typical spin lock using load link store conditional on ARM. Those are load exclusive store exclusive instructions. <coughs> Basically, if you're not familiar with those, uh, you have a load from an address and a subsequent store to that address on store condition only succeeds if there was no other update to the memory location in the meantime. Um, on uh, the hardware implementation on ARM uses an exclusive monitor or maybe multiple exclusive monitors. Um, and I'm going to model this, uh, let's say simple abstract model of the exclusive monitor in TLA plus. I'm using Pascal here, which is um, like pseudocode-like language. Um, well, some boilerplate extending some of the modules in there. You can declare constants, uh, which are actually, that's how you define um, the configuration of your uh, specification. We have CPUs and we have addresses. CPUs can be some abstract values. We call them P1 and P2. And the brackets in here, that means they are a set. Uh, so backslash star is the comment in, uh, in plus call. So our configuration consists of CPUs and a set of addresses. We don't care what, what they are. And the, the Pascal algorithm, so uh, usually the Pascal, well, normally Pascal code is written inside the TLA plus comment just because it expands it in line. You can probably expand it out of line, but in a different file, I haven't tried. Uh, anyway, uh, you declare the variables, so for our simple spin lock implementation, we have a memory array. The arrays and data structure in, in, uh, in TLA plus are 
are just functions defined on the, for example, memory here is defined on the domain of addresses with values in natural numbers. So we have a memory array um, indexed by, by our addresses and initialized to zero. We pick a lock address, so choose an address that satisfies the condition true. So it's basically just a random address in a, where we store our, our spin lock. And the exclusive monitor, uh, that's the ARM specific implementation of a load link store conditional. Uh, it's another array indexed by the number of CPUs. It's initially open, and this exclusive monitor can store uh, can either be open in an open state or a closed state, and it remembers the address that uh, load link uh, loaded from. And some macros in um, in plus call to declare our well to define our accesses to the exclusive monitor. Uh, the macros are modeled atomically in uh, TLA plus. So you don't need to worry about interleaving whatever you put in a macro. We have the, so setting the exclusive monitor, that would be done by a load link or load exclusive instruction. Uh, just sets the exclusive monitor to an address. And clearing the exclusive monitor, that would be done by a store. Uh, actually, we build the, the exclusive monitor status for all the CPUs. So that's our abstract model of the exclusive monitor. The hardware implementation is probably done differently. They may use the cache line state, like exclusive state. But for, for our uh, example, that's a it's just high level abstract view of the exclusive monitor. Now we have the instructions. So we define some instructions, like load exclusive, there's the load link on ARM. It says the exclusive monitor for the address and uh, it loads, it's, it sets the register to whatever was that, that memory location. A store exclusive, it succeeds only if the exclusive monitor for the current CPU, that's um, a current CPU, it uses the self by default, it generates the, uh, the variable. So it's only if the, current C, the exclusive monitor for the current CPU was set to the address uh, it succeeds in storing and it also clears the exclusive monitor for all the other CPUs. Uh, in case of uh, failing, it returns the status one. For completeness, I added the load instruction is not going to be used in this example. And uh, store instruction always succeeds in, uh, in updating the memory location but clears the exclusive monitor for all the CPUs. So, how would our locking implementation look like? Uh, spin lock procedure uh, makes use of the macros previously defined. So uh, one thing to remember is that in plus call, uh, when it's translated to TLA plus, so the atomicity, uh, each, each step that it models is actually needs to be represented by a label. So we can generate labels for you, but they are at a much coarser grain. So if you want final granularity in modeling the interleaving of uh, different CPUs executing, you add, uh, yeah, you have to add additional labels. If you add too many labels, that's another problem because your state space may explode and uh, it takes a long time to, to model. So uh, spin lock implementation using uh, load link store conditional. You do a load from an address. If the log val is, is not zero, it means that the log is taken, so you go again and read. That's a pretty dummy implementation. Now, if you succeeded in, uh, if the log value is zero, means the log is not taken, the store exclusive tries to store one to this, so take the log, and uh, again, if it succeeds, it returns. If not, if not, status is one, it means the store exclusive didn't succeed because there was another store to that location. Uh, it goes back again and tries to load the lock or spin forever. Uh, the unlocking is simple, it's just a store to that uh, memory location. Now, how we describe what we actually want to model. So we define the spin lock. Now we want to actually model put some action in this rather than having just the procedure. So the way we model this, we have, we define one 
process per CPU that tries to acquire the lock and release the lock in an infinite loop. So you can see spin lock, spin unlock, and we have a critical section. It's a no op. We just put a skip. It's, we are going to use this label later, but it doesn't actually have any effect. Now, properties. So we specify the algorithm. Now we want to go on to what properties we want to verify about uh, this algorithm. TLA plus is untyped. Uh, for some reason, you can read some of Lamport's lectures on why he thinks untyping is better. But uh, well, for, to make sure you don't actually have any bugs in, in your pseudocode, it's recommended to have a type invariant that uh, describes what your, uh, what your variables are. So basically here, memory is an array on the uh, indexed by addresses with the values in natural number. Exclusive monitor is, again, an array indexed by the CPU with values in addresses or open. So I have this uh, union. Now, in terms of properties, we want to show about algorithms. So one of the, the invariant or safety properties um, here is the exclusiveness. So we don't want two CPUs contending, two different CPUs contending on the lock to be in the critical section uh, at the same time. So we write our exclusive invariant here. So the invariants or safety properties are properties that should never happen um, in your execution. Uh, we define the well, theorem things here. They are just uh, purely for documentation. You usually add your invariants to a configuration file. So we have a configuration file for our model where we define the number of CPUs. I put two CPUs in here. I put only one address because we don't need more than that for our lock. And the invariant or the safety properties is type invariant and exclusive invariant. So all is fine. You can prove those things. Now, we go into liveness. So as I said, safety properties are properties that should never happen during execution. Liveness on the other hand, are properties that should eventually happen during the execution. And we want to show that actually, because this spec in here, it can be true, or those exclusive invariant, it can be true if actually the CPUs don't make any progress whatsoever. So you never get them into the critical section. So now we want to show that we want to verify that we actually get into the critical section with some, um, well, at least some of the, one of the CPUs. Because TLA plus allows infinite stuttering, that means that for any state, it can be an infinite state. Nothing could be changed from there. We have to require that our specification is fair, has some uh, at least weak fairness in that it eventually makes progress. So you expect your CPUs not to be stuck forever, like power, power down. You expect them to make progress and execute instructions. So we do this by declaring, putting a fair annotation in front of our process um, declaration there. And what it actually does, it extends our specification, as I've seen, as you can see above that, a spec now gains a weak fairness requirement so that and the CPUs actually make progress. All the CPUs make some progress. And we want to show our liveness properties. So one, the first property we check is there is at least one CPU in our implementation that makes progress, that enters the critical section. So PC is a variable that's generated by Pluscal. They have a PC and a stack in there used for uh, modeling execution. So we want to show that if, if the program counter for a CPU hits the start, uh, you can see in here, if, if, it, if it reaches the start point, then it eventually gets into the critical section. So liveness then is that we have at least one CPU. There exists a CPU. A liveness all is a more st stronger liveness property, is that all CPUs enter the, the critical section eventually. Now, our simple spin lock implementation doesn't guarantee liveness, 
because you can have one CPU starving the other. So if you try to emulate this, may not this liveness all. If you can prove liveness all, it implies liveness any in this case. But uh, yeah, we try to show both, uh, put both properties in there and see which one fails. Liveness any passes the test, liveness all doesn't. So when you run this thing, it, the TLA model checker comes up with this uh, output as a temporal properties were violated and it gives us a counter example of why it happens. So it tells us where the PC is. So just going briefly back here, we can see in this, in our spin lock implementation, the L3, so label three, we have the store exclusive label four is our check on what happened with the store exclusive. So in this, implementation here, it tells us that state 11, so it gives us a trace of the execution. So it tells us that at state 11, program counter uh, was L4 on both CPUs. So both CPUs executed the store exclusive. And if you check the status on the next line, it means that P2 failed because store exclusive returned one, the status was set to one, and P1 is zero, it means that P1 succeeded in, uh, in storing, uh, in taking the lock. And the memory was updated, so we have the address, uh, the value at address A1 is one, and the exclusive monitor is open on both CPUs. So at uh, this stage in state 11, we have uh, CPU one, CPU P1 succeeding in taking the lock, CPU two failed. They both executed uh, the store exclusive at the same time, only one of them took the lock. Now, further down in the stack, in the execution trace, oh, the behavior, sequence. Uh, we have state 25, where again, we have P1 at uh, position L4. It means that it executed the store exclusive. P2 is about to execute the store exclusive. However, it will fail because the exclusive monitor was cleared by the P1 execution, successful execution of the store exclusive. So it tells us that now we go back to state 11. So in our execution trace, we have a loop in this uh, behavior graph. We have a loop from state 11 to state 25, and then we never go to state 26 because it goes back to state 11. So it found the loop at where P2 never managed to get the lock. So our liveness, all property here, that all CPUs eventually reach the critical section is violated. So now we have a queued spin lock model, which is um, aimed to guarantee liveness for all the CPUs. Uh, also more, more scale, scales better because all CPUs, they, they spin on their own data structure rather than having a common uh, shared memory location to spin on. Uh, one trick with you know, the queued spin lock implementation in Linux, it's, it's fairly complex. Um, because they spin, each CPU spins on an MCS lock. Um, you can't have just one MCS lock per CPU because you have different nesting contexts. For example, you get an interrupt that may take a completely different lock. So uh, you need uh, multiple MCS locks per CPU. And uh, yeah, Linux, we call those nodes. We have the number of nodes in there per CPU. Well, the way to model this, so uh, because we want to test all the combinations, let's take, take multiple nesting contexts in there and see whether our uh, implementation or whether we spot any, any issues with the implementation. Uh, the way we model this now is not just with uh, one thread per CPU, actually one thread per CPU per node. And uh, give some ASCII art in here. So we have for each CPU, we have multiple threads as a tuple of uh, P1, uh, well, a tuple of the node and the CPU. And we model it as multiple spin locks. So each node, or I'll say nesting context, it's they, they contend on, uh, on the same Q spin lock. So now we, we have a, we, I modeled this as, you know, multiple spin locks being taken um, uh, by multiple threads. So in the, 
in the configuration file, we have, uh, as you've seen with the simple spin lock implementation, uh, the same, the set of CPUs. I didn't bother with the memory here because the memory is not relevant uh, in this case. Uh, we don't have a load store exclusive to emulate. Um, we have a max, in, max nodes and pending loops is something in the, in the QSpin lock implementation in Linux, just to some optimization. Uh, also define some of, for example, no CPU is a way to define a CPU. I, I mean, they, they don't have a CPU assigned, some, some abstract values in here. They help with uh, converting the algorithm from C into, um, into Pascal. It's not a straightforward you know, uh, translation, but it, it's fairly close. Now, we won't have time to go through all the QSpin lock implementation here. Uh, threads, as I've said, they are, they are modeled as uh, we, have, we have one thread per CPU per node, so we just uh, declare the threads as a Cartesian product between the CPUs and the uh, number of nodes. And the types that uh, introduced in Pascal, they match fairly closely, uh, if you yeah, look from farther away. Uh, the C on, on the right, in the comment on the right hand side, you can see the actual uh, C implementation, C data structure that we have for Qt spin lock in Linux. Uh, it's a union. In Pascal, you just use the, it's the set theory that helps here defining the, the structure. Again, Q lock type is just like a, a set on the domain representing the lock pending tail index tail CPU. So uh, that's how you define the types for your data structure. Locked is a, is a Boolean. Uh, yeah, tail index, we don't have uh, like a 16 bit. We have in the C implementation here, I added this as two separate items for the index and the, and the CPU. And the MCS lock type, that's something, it, that's, that's the variable each CPU spins on while, while waiting on a queue. Adding some constructors, again, for initializing some of the variables uh, in Linux. I'm going to go over them. And that's where what we have. So that's, uh, those are the variables that we use for for our simulation here, we have the Q spin lock. We have one Q spin lock per node uh, initialized to unlock. And we have one MCS lock per thread, which means per CPU per node. And that's, that's a way, there's a way to initialize variables in plus call. And some accessors that you throw the algorithm. Now you can see the, the full implementation is on my kernel TLA Git repository. In terms of uh, invariance and uh, you know, safety properties here, as usual, the type invariant, we want to make sure we don't mess up something in the algorithm of the typing. And for the exclusive invariant, we want that any threads contending on, uh, on the same lock, they can't be in the critical section at the same time. So as I as I shown in here, we have, we actually have uh, multiple QSpin locks and multiple threads. And yeah, we allow the P11 thread to be in the critical section at the same time with the P2 on node 2 thread. So uh, it doesn't, this is allowed. We just don't want the same, the two CPUs contending on the same, like on QSpin lock 1 to be in the critical section. So, yeah, the way you write an exclusive invariance here, say for any different, any two threads running on different CPUs and contending on the same lock, they can't be in the critical section at the same time. In terms of liveness, so liveness any that's, uh, that's verified just fine is uh, there is at least one thread that once started, it enters the critical, eventually enters the critical section. For the liveness of, we want, actually, we can't guarantee that all the CPUs enter, well, all the threads enter the critical section. 
what we want to show here that all CPUs actually enter a critical section at some nesting context. So in this case here, we have the, on node one, we have the, let's say we have the task um, in the task context, in Linux, in the process context, they try to acquire the Q spin lock. You can get an interrupt. It tries to acquire another spin lock. Now, because uh, we can't guarantee that we, we can get a continuous interrupt, so you can't always guarantee that the task uh, thread actually enters the, the critical section if you get an interrupt, a continuous interrupt. So the way we specify this is that on one CPU, so on all CPU, CPUs, we have at least one nesting context that enters the critical section. So, what was I here? Yeah, so that's the liveness also. For all CPUs, there exists a node uh, for which the program counter, as I said, the threads are represented as tuples of a processor and the node. So we have at least one thread uh, on that CPU that enters the critical section. Now, findings. Um, so when I ran on the first model, we, yeah, it, it didn't make progress. There were some infinite loops in, uh, in the Q-spin lock implementation that uh, were not making any progress in, in there. So I guess looking at that after I modeled, you know, it's pretty obvious that those infinite loops may not actually make progress. So there are some uh, weird scenarios. So the two CPUs, one was probably easier to reason about. There was a three CPU scenario where the Q spin log did not make any progress. Uh, so the first two commits from, uh, from Will Deacon, um, he actually unrolled the loops, removed them. So they fixed the liveness properties for, for ARM64 with uh, LSE Atomics. So LSE Atomics is an addition to ARM V8.1 architecture. Uh, they guarantee us some progress versus the store load, store exclusive, that don't have such guarantees. And so in this, um, I think in the last merging window, uh, Peter Zilstra also sent a patch, merged the patch to fix a comp exchange loop on x86 that, again, was not uh, giving us the liveness guarantees. So with those changes, the model also, also verifies the liveness all property. Now, some, some uh, drawbacks here. This model is, uh, well, doesn't, doesn't model the memory ordering semantics, so it's sequential consistency only. One could build uh, an operational model on top of this and um, model it, but it's, yeah, the, you get the, the state space grows, grows significantly, so may not finish in uh, your lifetime. So it, it's a complex algorithm as well. And uh, yeah, so for example, liveness checking is for two threads is under one minute, a few hours for three threads and uh, days for four threads. And uh, I think I tried some more, but it ran out of memory. Um, yeah, in, in variant checking, so if you want just to check the safety properties, that's, um, a significantly faster, and it has a way to add some symmetry optimization. Um, it tries to, so TLA plus can check, so your program doesn't need to terminate. You can have infinite loops in your, in your model. Uh, you just need to have a finite set of states. Now, if you add the symmetry optimization, you tell, tell it you have some permutations in there. You don't care whether it's P1 or P2, the name in which order. You tell them this is the same CPU. The algorithm is symmetric on P1 and P2. And in that case, it can squash the, um, uh, it can squash the state space. So it's much faster if you only do invariant checking. Liveness checking cannot be done with symmetry optimizations because it may wrongly detect some loops in your execution trace and wrongly tell you that uh, your liveness properties fail. Also, it has a simulate mode, so that just checks random behaviors. It's like a depth first search up to a maximum depth. And um, it's quite quick. For example, the ARM64, the ACID allocation algorithm, 
it was taking about a day and a half on six, well, emulating six, six CPUs, it was taking like a day and a half to, to hit the bug, and it was taking like five minutes to simulate mode. Uh, the downside of the simulation is that it's not always the shortest path to, to get there. So you get like something 185 execution steps and then it just uh, is pretty hard to actually figure out where things went wrong. So ideas for future models, if uh, people are interested, I, I managed to trick one guy in my well, joined our team as a graduate on rotation, so wanted to do kernel work, so I tricked him into doing this. Uh, <laughs> he did the KVM and VGIC uh, model, so it's pretty cool. But. And yeah, th there are lots of things to model if one has time. Uh, may look at some of them. There are interesting properties to, to prove. And of course, there are other tools out there. Uh, the reason I I used TLA plus was mainly was relatively easy to define uh, well to specify liveness properties. Uh, most of the tools I've seen they don't handle liveness. You have to figure out how to check liveness in your algorithm by let's say for example uh, adding your own asserts in there that you don't have some loops in your algorithm. With uh, TLA plus you kind of keep, keep the, your properties separate from your specification. So, yeah, that's why I, I used it so far. But yeah, there are other tools out there. And uh, I think this state, this, yes. <laughs> on the rebound. On the, on the RC left, the model, yes, there are. Um, they configured things down to the bare minimum to make it fit in their tool. So they didn't, they didn't model preemp uh, preemptible RCU, they didn't model priority boosting, they didn't model energy efficiency, they didn't model relationship to idle. Um, and uh, so, yeah, but it, they did the easy part. Yeah, I Although think. it was still hard and stressed their tool to the limit. Yeah. So even we I had, for example, in some of the my examples here that I verified. The, um, I think the KPTI, we have software panels, privilege access network, and KPTI is this thing where we have a security feature. We disable, um, well, we disable the, the access to the kernel page, ta page tables while in user space. That's a meltdown mitigation. And we actually had the bug. So then modeling this had to add a lot of the preemption stuff. It's not even built into Pascal, so you have to hack some TLA plus on top of Pascal to simulate preemption. And um, ah, but it's, once you understand it, uh, yeah, it gets quite easy. So uh, questions? Here. Is there any? It doesn't work. Uh, is there any connection to the code that actually runs? Sorry? Is there any connection to the code that actually runs? That's, uh, well, there is. <laughs> <laughs> there is a connection. So th this mainly is, th the aim is to verify the algorithm. So. As long as to say, the algorithms are verified, the programs are executed. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's modeling high-level algorithms. And there is no uh, direct connection from, uh, from the Pascal model to like, uh, have some kind of automated conversion. There was a, someone, there was a PhD thesis on uh, converting C to TLA+, but uh, they didn't go very far. I think they just it was a proof of concept, and I haven't heard anything since. And yeah, the, the, the actual thing is that the algorithm is the connection. You mentioned it only verifies sequential consistency. What sorts of things would you need to do for a weaker memory model? 
how would you even go about describing that to something like TLA plus or plus cal? Well, you'd have to describe, so the, the simplest would be to go for an operational model. Let's say you model a write buffer, and instead of updating a variable, you send something to the write buffer, and then you describe all the behaviors of that write buffer. It can reorder stuff. And uh, yeah, it, it increases uh, your state space quite a bit, but it's doable. I mean, uh, when uh, a poor man's approach is to, okay, I update this variable and this variable, what happens if they are seen in a different order? You just swap them and say, yeah, it doesn't work. But that's a, like a poor man's hack. Of, uh, so we, I think for, if you are interested in memory modeling, there are other tools out there. And it's not about, I mean, I used locks in here, but as you can see from, uh, from those examples, it's not about locks, it's about modeling other algorithms, so. Yeah. So how long does it take you to write these models? You, do you start with the code and then write the model and then? Well, actually, well, it initially took me some time because I had to read the documentation. <laughs> But uh, I think for the cute spin lock, it took me like two, three days to translate the cute spin lock implementation from Linux to Pascal. And I have to admit, I didn't even fully understand it. So it's like a <laughs> 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 you can do a mechanical transition. Well, then, then I actually try to understand it some <clears throat> more. But um, well, the corner case is in there. So it doesn't take too long. You can see here I have a, it's not the best example here. Uh, it emulates instructions. But it's pretty close to C. So apart from some annoying stuff for where to, you need to put semicolons, but uh, otherwise it's, it's, it's not that far. And it's quite flexible in terms of the, because it, it, it handles the set theory quite well, so it's quite flexible on how you define your data structures. You don't need to think of how you pack stuff into bits. You just, uh, for example, you just define, okay, I have this data layout in there and just describe it. I don't care about the bit layout as you can see on the C implementation. Uh, uh, so in theory, could, uh, could you use the TLA model to detect uh, the deadlock? Deadlocks? Yeah. Yes, so deadlocks is more like a liveness condition. So it detects two types of deadlocks, TLA plus. So it has one, it really spots it when, uh, for example, you have this, uh, where was it? So plus call translates into something like this, for example. And it needs that an action like tick or count uh, only takes place if the condition is true. So if it is enabled like tick equal last tick in there. So if your model, if all your actions are disabled, there is no condition that, that allows next to make a progress, it tells you deadlock. You can have some other types of like a life lock. For example, you have a spin lock implementation that keeps spinning. Uh, that's a dead lock, for example. But uh, TLA plus still seeing some action, so we won't report it. You have to add the liveness property in there. Thank you. I can prove termination as well, but it wasn't the case here because we had infinite loops. So it's another liveness condition. Thank you.